Good morning everyone. Welcome back to Pine Hollow out at Agnostics. It's Thursday morning, April 8th, and we're heading west. Uh, first stop is going to be near Cleveland, Ohio. We have a Lexus with a swapped engine and some lean codes that's getting really bad gas mileage. So let's head out. It's about a four hour drive. XL7 is ready to roll. Trailer's hooked up. Scanners, scopes, jack. The whole repair kit is loaded up. And so is some motorcycle gear. Should be a fun trip. All right, first stop on the Indiana road trip. We're near Cleveland, Ohio, and we have a 2007 Lexus RX 350. History with the vehicle is, engine's not original. It was replaced about 30,000 miles ago because an oil cooler line blew. We kept driving it, ran out of oil. Kaboom, not good. So anyways, replacement engine is here. It runs, it drives. Uh, but the owner says that it gets terrible gas mileage, like 13 miles to the gallon on premium fuel. And uh, once in a while the check engine light comes on. So that's the customer complaint. He said so far after the engine swap the only things that were replaced is mass airflow sensor. You know, he said this is an aftermarket one. So keep that in mind. And then the upstream oxygen sensor on bank 2. I assume it's an air fuel ratio sensor. So that's what's been done. Let's uh, scan it for codes. And in the engine we have two codes. System 2 lean bank 1, system 2 lean bank 2. P0171, P0174. Okay, so let's jump right in the engine. And I want to see on the data all the O2 sensors and the fuel trims, mass airflow, uh, just basic, basic data here. So engine speed, coolant temp, that's important, grams per second, intake air. Now, bank one sensor two, bank two sensor two, those are regular uh, sensors, and then air fuel sensors upstream and then our fuel trims there, open loop, closed loop, I think that should be good enough for now. Alright, so let's start it up. See the long term fuel trims are at 20% right now, so that's the memory. Air fuel sensor bank one and bank two. Um, 3.3 is stoichiometric. If it goes lower, it's rich. If it goes higher, it's lean. So opposite of a regular O2 sensor. So it looks like we're working okay there. We're in closed loop already. Let's graph the downstream O2 sensors. See if these guys wake up. Take it for a little spin. All right, so our downstreams are still stuck at zero. Our long-term fuel trim is at 25%. Short term is at 10%. So 30, all, like 35% altogether. I'm just gonna raise the RPM a bit. So you can see this car is trying to wake up these downstream sensors. They are completely unresponsive. And when you rev it up, it's really sluggish to rev up. I'll take it for a little spin around the block just to, for good measure, but... There's something wrong with our downstream sensors. And on Toyota, the downstream sensors are also a key part in the fuel trim strategy. You might think they're just there to monitor the cats. That's not the case. They need to be working. 
Alrighty, so car is running actually just fine. The downstream sensors did wake up. Uh, that's just part of the strategy. If there's something wrong with the sensors, like if there was no signal, the car would set a code. So what's wrong with this thing? Why are the long-term fuel trims right now at 32%? Crazy. We're at stoichiometric for sure, but look at that mass airflow grams per second reading. We're only at 2.5 grams per second. That's not, that's not good. This is supposed to be, you know, a three and a half liter engine at idle. Should be about three and a half grams per second, rule of thumb. So our mass airflow sensor is reading way low all the time because if you look at the long term fuel trims here, they're always about from 20 to 30. Now we're at 35. So across the board, it's reading really low. And if you look at the mass airflow sensor, I'm gonna raise the RPMs up a little bit. So we're at about 10 grams per second. Fuel trims are about 20. If I let off the gas, we're back to 35. And the math drops down to about two, two and a half. So you might say, could there be a vacuum leak? Yes, we can check for a vacuum leak, but considering it's an aftermarket mass airflow sensor, that's what, you know, that's what it needs. And I asked the owner, do you have the old one? He's like, no. <laughs> uh, I've never seen a Toyota mass airflow sensor go bad. Sometimes they get a little dirty, but you can clean them easily. Um, we can pop it out, see what, you know, what it looks like, but otherwise this car is running just fine. So one thing that we could check under the hood is the purge solenoid, it's right here. So I put my finger over it, there's definitely vacuum and our mass airflow sensor reading does not change. It's 2.3 and if I take my finger off it's about the same. So that's a very small controlled leak um, so that's it this guy made in China I don't like it gotta get a new one see if it's available so I'm wondering why the owners complaining about his fuel economy it's almost 19 miles per gallon which for this car for if you're driving around the city it's reasonable it's not like 13 or something but otherwise it drives really smooth like a Lexus just sets a check engine light for these lean codes because the mass airflow sensor is under reporting. Simple as that. Um, the owner will get an OEM sensor, pop it in, it's guaranteed, and then um, if it works then we're good to go. So on to the next one. Columbus. The fuel economy is uh, oh, less than 20 miles per gallon. There's a massive headwind, so XL7 is, you know, it's doing fine, but look at the gas. All right, next stop, we're at the south end of Columbus, Ohio. We got a Volvo S60 Turbo, exactly like the silver one that we saw with the uh, busted PCB valve. This one has 240,000 miles on it. Almost 240,000 miles. And it runs like crap. The owner said that the other shop couldn't even start it. The battery was dead. And it's definitely misfiring. Quick and dirty cylinder drop test. Yep, number one's good. Number five is good. No spark there. 
no spark there, no spark there. So there you go. Three coils are dead on this car. I'm, I don't know how that's possible. But the compression is good, surprisingly. And they just got a new spark plug. So I'd say replace all the ignition coils with a name brand. Now I'll fix this car. Amazing, because sometimes Volvos are not that expensive to repair. Um, that's it for this one. Moving on to the next one. All right, so it's evening in Columbus. We have a 2009 Ford Mustang with only 6,000 miles on the clock. It has a problem with the driver's side power window. So what does what the power window do, Bill? It, it goes up in little steps. Yes. Can you, can you demonstrate? <clears throat> So that's all it does, even if you hold the button up, it'll keep going in little steps. Kind of similar to that Subaru Outback that we diagnosed. And then when you uh, open the door, you said the window just drops all the way down. Yeah, yeah. So it's supposed to go up on its own here. Boom, all the way down. Okay, interesting. So in the service info one way to deinitialize the window to completely reset it is disconnect the battery cable from the battery while the window is operating all right so close the door bill and then so we have like what two seconds while the windows rolling up yeah okay I'll just disconnect the battery while it's rolling up and Okay, okay, uh, yep, and again. Try to roll it up. Okay. Okay. So that's supposed to deinitialize it. And then initialization is. The door must be closed during this procedure for convertibles. Top of the cord glass must be closed. Must be in full open position. The procedure operate correctly. Press and hold the window control switch in up position at the second detent until the window glass stalls into the glass top for at least two seconds. That doesn't happen because it keeps going up in increments, so we can't hold the switch up to do that. It's a very simple procedure, but it doesn't work. So first question is, does the switch work? And it does in both, all four positions. So if I lift up to the second detent, let it go, the window. Does that. So all the way down, it starts going down automatically, but only goes down for, you know, one or two inches. Now coming up, this is manual mode, auto mode, doesn't do the same as down. Okay, so there's a, a chance that there's something wrong with the switch and it doesn't see the second detent and you can't initialize this window. So we need to actually pull this off and see what the switches are doing, uh, you know, the button in all four positions. Okay, so let's take a close look at this diagram. Here's our master window adjust switch. This is the one for the driver's window. And here is the power window motor left front. Three wires from the switch to the motor. There's up, down, and auto. So if you go to the first detent up or first detent down, you're just toggling these two wires, white, black, or the yellow. Now, if you go all the way down, you know, double click or double click up, you also energize this auto, violet, and light green wire. Double switch there. So I wanna pop the switch out and with a test light, we can see if the switch is behaving normally. We can even do that 
at the same switch with these three wires because the uh, passenger side window works just fine. Alright, so inside the car here's the power window switch and the owner said that he already replaced it. So brand new OEM Ford switch. Just want to quickly check the uh, pins with a test light. So first we're going from battery positive to that auto up down pin. That would be this guy here. Violet and light green. So whenever you push the switch all the way up or all the way down, it grounds this violet and light green. Boom. So basically, you can try it. There's all the way up. If you keep holding the switch, it'll keep the light lit. Okay. And I checked the other two. So from, um, you know, test light to ground, the up and the down, everything works. So, final call here is the power window motor because that is the only thing that has any logic of where this window is. And we know that this wiring integrity is good to the interior lights. It says short drop. Because the window goes all the way down when you know you open the door. So that's good. And to be 120% sure, we could take the door panel off and check each one of these pins. But you know, at this point, I say put a new uh, window motor in it. And well, if that doesn't fix it, I'll have to give the customer a refund. But that's uh, that's my call on this. Um, he said on the forums, the smart junction box is sometimes a culprit with corrosion and stuff. But we know that a the passenger window works fine. So and the only thing that ties the actual window motor to the junction box is are these two wires, and that's just the accessory delay relay power and a constant power to power up this little module inside the motor and you know we know that works because well a the other side works and with the key off the window still still works so that accessory relay is uh, functional so that wire is definitely good so that's it and we'll uh, owner will replace the motor and tell me if it works so here's the actual voltage on the auto up or the auto down you know, the auto wire and whenever you push the switch all the way up or all the way down we should that should drop to zero so it's 11.5 all the way up stays at zero let it go 11.5 So we know wiring integrity from the motor to the switch is good. That's good, that's good. The motor moves, so that's good. It knows when you open the door, that's fine. It's definitely grounded since the motor works, that's fine. So the only two variables left here are the two power wires coming from the smart junction box. Um, but again, those shouldn't really have anything to do with the logic in here. That's it. Needs a new power window motor.